My name is Noha Abu Dhab. I'm a fellow at Brookings, and it's my pleasure to moderate tonight's panel on the role of revolutionary art in political expression and peace building. For many of us who grew up in various parts of the Arab world, art in all its forms, whether it's literature, music, theater, satire, has always occupied a prominent space in how our societies grapple with their present, their past, and their uncertain future. Um, art in times of war, art in times of transition, art in times of peace, um, art as a form of resistance, art as a battleground for propaganda versus the truth, um, art as a battleground for writing and rewriting history. And of course, art as revolution, which is the overarching theme for our panel discussion tonight. We know that art aggravates and provokes. We know that political leaders pay attention to political art. Some of you may know the legendary Egyptian poet uh, Ahmed Fouad Nigm or Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish and many, many others who were imprisoned for their poetic critiques of, of political oppression. Some of you may also know that it was words in the form of graffiti on the wall of, uh, of a school in Syria, uh, spray painted by a 14-year-old boy that in part sparked the revolution there, the violent repercussions of which, of course, we still see unfolding today, almost a decade later. And the words were, Ajak al-Duriya Doktor in Arabic, or it's your turn, doctor, referring to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. At the same time, <clears throat> Graffiti art, revolutionary songs, political cartoons proliferated in Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, and other parts of the region. In an act of art as celebration, memory, resistance, mourning, and political expression. So how can we speak of art as a mechanism of resistance, revolution, documentation, and memorialization? Does it create an effective space for political dialogue and peace building? So to help us navigate these questions tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel of different types of artists from across the region. <coughs> to my left is Atiyaf Al-Wazir. She's a researcher and lecturer. She's a researcher and lecturer at Lille University by day and a writer by night. She focuses on gender and the intersection of art and politics. She was born in Sana'a in Yemen and raised in Washington, D.C. And in 2011, she chronicled the, the Yemeni revolution and co-founded the media collective Support Yemen. She writes political op-eds, fiction, and creative non-fiction, and she's been published in several outlets, including The Guardian, Jadaleya, and Foreign Policy. Atiyaf is currently writing a novel uh, set in Yemen and in Dearborn, Michigan, about a woman on a quest to heal herself in the midst of a revolution. Welcome, Atiyaf. To Atiyaf's left is Suraya Murayev. Uh, she is a writer from the best city in the world, which is Alexandria, Egypt, my hometown as well. Um, she has a master's in creative and cultural industries from King's College London. In 2011, Soraya began to document the emergence and evolution of street art in post-revolution Egypt via her award-winning blog, Suzy in the City. She's written for several media outlets, including the Sunday Telegraph, the National, Cultura, and Jadaleya, and her photos have been published in the Smithsonian Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times Lead, Esquire Middle East, the Atlantic Online, and Huffington Post. Soraya has also worked on award-winning documentaries, Noise of Cairo and Gaza Surf Club, and she has lectured on graffiti at several institutions around the world. She currently lives in Cairo, Egypt. Welcome, Soraya. Last but not least, we have uh, Khaled al -Bay. He's a Sudanese artist and political cartoonist who was born in Romania. He currently lives in Copenhagen where he works as the Pan Artist in Residence at the International Cities of Refuge Network. He is the 2018 inaugural Soros Arts Fellow for the Open Society Foundation. 
Based here in Doha since 1990, Khaled worked as the head of public art for Qatar Museum's authority. Khaled publishes his cartoons on social media under the name Khartoun, a pun on his hometown, the Sudanese capital Khartoum. His cartoons have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, NPR, and the BBC, and he has published commentary in The Guardian, CNN, and Al Jazeera, among others. Khaled's work has been exhibited in many countries around the globe. So, welcome. Khaled. Thank you. So, each speaker will have about eight minutes uh, to make some remarks. Um, I will then kickstart a discussion with a couple of questions, and then we will open it to questions from the audience. And uh, we, we, we will wrap up by 10.45 at the latest, rest assured, your suhoor meal will then be served. Um, so, Atiyaf, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Salam, everyone. Khawat Mubaraka. I'm honored to be here today with you to speak about something very important, art and conflict. Um, and I'd like to start first by paying tribute to all the artists living, currently living in conflict areas, breathing life into areas of destruction. Um, I am in awe of their work. I am inspired by their ability to turn the ugliness into beauty. Um, today, as you know, in Yemen, um, the violence is everywhere. Uh, a recent report stated that by 2020, about 200,000 people would have been killed, um, mainly, due to, um, mainly due to the lack of infrastructure, hospitals, food, medicine. Will art bring food to these to the tables, will art uh, do that? No. Will art, you know, um, cure cholera, for example? Of course not. I, I'm not arguing that art is a panacea for everything. But is art irrelevant? Of course not. Art is very, very, very important. Uh, art allows people to live while they're living, and art uh, increases the quality of life while you're living. Art documents uh, violations pushes us to um, look at taboos, discuss them. Um, art also inspires people and, and, and brings hope. And in a time where everybody is seeing death all around, you need a little bit of escape. You need to laugh. You need to breathe again. And this artist here, I just have one or uh, two photos, is a Yemeni artist, Saba Jallas, uh, who does exactly that. Um, the photo in the bottom is of, of an explosion. And what she does is she sketches over these explosions. Uh, you know, it could be this, an image of a mother with a, ch a child, or it could be an image of a, a child going to school. Now, this is not, not just naive hope. This is about reclaiming agency, right? This is about saying we are not only uh, about uh, death and destruction, but we also are about resilience. And, and, and it's this type of art that is very, very important in times of conflict. Uh, another reason why I think art is extremely important in times of conflict is that it's a way to heal trauma during conflict. And that's what I want to focus on right now. Uh, and uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on the, power, the healing power of fiction, whether it's short stories or novels, to, uh, to heal um, during times of conflict. Um, how does one do that? I, I, I will give you an example from my personal experience. I fell in a depression post uh, 2000, about maybe, well, I realized it maybe end of 2013, like so many people who were involved in the revolution, there is a sense of collective uh, trauma, and it, it stems from a lot of things, you know, the loss of, of, uh, of the feeling of a loss of hope, the loss of a home, the loss of a dream, and of course added with that, is when you lose people you love to death or to, to um, unf being unfairly uh, imprisoned, et cetera. Um, uh, so what happened is I didn't have really words to, uh, to describe what was happening to me. I didn't really understand it. And I didn't understand the severity because everyone around me was suffering the same thing. We all just didn't have the words to describe it. So I, what I did was I took a step back from activism. I took a step back from politics. And that was extremely strange for someone like me who was very, very active in politics ever since I was young. I come from a hyper-political family. Our bedtime stories were about two, mainly two characters. 
my grandfather who was beheaded for the cause, political, and his actually head, still, a picture of his head still hangs in the military museum in Sana'a. That was our, you know, our bedtime stories as, you know, oh, two revolutionaries. And my grandmother, who was very strong and supposedly never cried in the face of adversity, despite the imprison, political imprisonment of her four children, including my father. So that was my roadmap of what politics looked like. And so when I fell in this depression, I felt extremely selfish, extremely weak. I was not like them. Uh, and I, I couldn't even admit that to myself. I felt embarrassed. And I didn't, again, didn't know how to speak about this. Um, and then one day, I'm speaking to my grandmother, and she's telling me a funny story about her childhood. And I asked her, can I interview you about your life? And she said, mm, why don't you interview your, your uncle, the uh, doctor? I'm, what am I going to say about it? So no, no, I want to interview your life. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, we don't you know, document women's histories often uh, in our countries. Uh, and then after a lot of back and forth, she said, fine, you can document it. You, but you must turn it into a musalsal Ramadan. <laughs> I said, uh, we'll see about that, right? So I start transcribing her, her interviews. And, and then I start to write the story, and something very strange happened. I suddenly started to change the information. I, I had intended to write it exactly as she told me. But I started to change her character, and she morphed into this person that was from the past, but from the present, someone I knew very well, but someone I also didn't know at all. I changed the locations a little bit, I changed the place, uh, and I started to suddenly, uh, you know, inadvertently, I started writing fiction or slightly based on real life, but started changing a lot of this. And I felt really great. And so every day I started to write, and every day it became a new story. And, I, and by the end of this, I had a first draft. It took a long time, of course, a very, very long time. But I had suddenly started to breathe again. And I want to tell you quickly uh, why I think this was healing. Um, first, I think writing fiction gave me a, a chance to transcend the here and now. I was no longer in my head thinking about all the pain. I wasn't thinking about the pregnant women that are dying in checkpoints that I can't control right now. I wasn't thinking about the, 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 the kids who I, I couldn't help, I couldn't do anything to, for. But I was processing that, those emotions with the characters I had created. I was creating dialogue, I was arguing with them, I was fighting with them. And these new emotions started, I started to process these emotions that I didn't know how to process before through, my, through arguing sometimes with my characters. I'm not crazy. We just have a <laughs> lot of arguments and sometimes discussions, we, you know, through, through, through these, these characters of mine. Um, I also started, writing also started, uh, helped me reflect. You know, it, we live in this world where in social media you have to comment every second. And if you stop and say, mm, I need a moment, people are wondering, why? Well, why, why do you need a moment? Are you against them? Are you with them? Uh, you feel very, very overwhelmed. And when, uh, when I took a step back from so, uh, social media, and we, so I was talking about this with some friends today, it gave me a chance to breathe, and it gave me, and writing fiction gave me a chance to also write stuff without feeling the pressure to find the solution. I just needed to elaborate on what was happening. I needed to process my emotions. And I also, at points, made some, in some of my short stories, made people who hurt me very much the um, protagonist of my story. It was very hard. But through that, I, I developed empathy for somebody who was very, very hurtful at some point. And I, th and I think that is, in a way, is. A, a, uh, a, a type of healing, right? Um, you will tell me when I run out of time. <laughs> um, and it also allowed me to transcend linear thinking. You know, we live in this polarized world, unfortunately now, and especially in conflict areas, where uh, you know politi the political climate is extremely pol polarized. Um, identity politics plays a very big role, but fiction uh, allows you to transcend that and to go deeper into the different layers. We don't shy, in fiction, we don't shy away from complexities. Actually, we embrace them. And that is something I didn't find in today's media, unfortunately. Uh, and it's something that I think if we do embrace complexities, if we do look at things as they're just, they're not, you know, linear, we, that's a road towards peace. That's one step towards peace because it enlarges the universe and it creates empathy, sympathies and, and, and it enhances empathy. And I'll end with, like, the last reason why it healed me is I was 
allowed to go back home. When you are in exile, whether it's something you chose for yourself or forced exile, there's a lot of nostalgia. And writing allows me to go back home every single day. I'm able to go back to, to the house where I lived, but the house that I remembered. I didn't let my memories be hijacked by all the blood. The house I remembered is there, and it will stand strong. And that's a way to heal and to remember that. And, and, it, and I do believe it's political, because just because um, Yemen might not be this way right now, as I remember it, it can return to that way. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think perceptions of reality are, in, re are reinforced by the stories we tell. And this is why it's very important not to make Yemen or any area of conflict just a, a single story of, uh, of, of suffering. Yes, there is great suffering, but there's also, but let's also write about life. Let's also write about um, um, uh, the way we are, are able to embrace and to survive this, this kind of suffering. And I think everybody should write their story, and I hope one day to be able to write my grandmother's story who couldn't read and write, maybe in a Muslim Ramadan. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm here because, um, like millions of Egyptians, I was witness to some of the most pivotal and seminal years in my country's history. And I wanted to be useful. I wanted to be part of the revolution that unfolded. But because I was too scared to be at the front lines, I picked up a camera instead. And I took photographs of the walls. And as you can see from these photos, um, we went from whitewashed, bare walls to an explosion of graffiti, and very diverse. You had feminist graffiti, patriotic murals, paintings of those who had lost their lives in the protests or accidents. You had artists bring pulp fiction to the streets of downtown Cairo, but change the characters into Egyptian old school actors. You had poetry, Pablo Neruda, Nietzsche. You had Quranic verses. And you had graffiti in solidarity with Yemen and Syria and Palestine. It was a truly phenomenal time to be alive. And from my biased personal experience, I do believe that Cairo street art did have an impact on our society. And it was a profound factor or a necessary component in creating a healthy democracy. Now, there's always the argument that graffiti is illegal, it's a form of vandalism, it's illegitimate. But another way of looking at this is there are two forms of political participation. One is institutionalized, which conforms to norms, doesn't challenge authorities' uh, legitimacy. And the other non-institutional participation, which would be, I mean, graffiti would be a part of that, is obviously the opposite of that. So it can be stigmatized, and those practicing it are isolated. But essentially, people who make art, or people who make graffiti and political art are often doing so because they feel alienated from the political discourse. And graffiti for many artists and activists in Egypt was their last or only means to communicate to the rest of the world. Cairo street art was a tool. It was a call to action. It was used by rights groups, women's rights groups, political parties during ca campaigning for the elections. It was adopted by many causes because it educated, it raised awareness, and it communicated. It also helped represent a viewpoint that wasn't necessarily making it to mainstream media. It represented voices that weren't being heard. And it was, it was translatable to an international audience where language was no longer a barrier. So in that sense, it also created some intercultural understanding of sorts. And the street art that I followed also created a vibrant community. It inspired civic participation. I personally witnessed groups of people surrounding these artists. It could have been, I mean, it was street kids, 
um, shop owners, neighbors, random passers-by. Some would be helping them paint, others were holding um, the ladder, people were making them tea, engaging in conversation with them, often very heated debate about the merit of their work, the value, whether it was vandalism or an, an art form. And so that in itself created sort of a, a coming together of people from very different social groups, engaging in something that, if you can look at it in one way, it would be a shared identity or a unique culture. All of these, I believe, are components to a democracy. So I didn't know it then, but the, this was sort of the evolution of a small part that contributed to what was essentially a very healthy democracy. And I'm not going to pretend to be impartial or unbiased because I'm clearly emotionally invested in this and I never try to look at it from a distanced view. I was emotionally invested, I befriended the artists, I loved the work that they did, um, I loved the work that I did. But I do also believe that street art provided some kind of a service, a service of emotional value and intrinsic value to the community. One example is um, when military blockades shut off several side streets in downtown Cairo, effectively paralyzing a whole neighborhood. Street artists painted on these blockades pomptois, so illusions of you know, the street continuing, rainbows, children playing. So what they gave the neighborhood was a regained sense of ownership and the illusion that these blockades weren't paralyzing them. And that was ex extremely important at the time. Another very famous example is Muhammad Mahmoud Street, which was a site to many protests and a lot of violence. Muhammad Mahmoud Street, as you can see from these photos, the murals were mostly of martyrs, of kids as young as eight, um, who had died in clashes or other accidents, of mothers of the dead, um, reminding us of their names, their ages, and when and how they died. What happened was, it somehow turned into a memorial space. No one planned it, it just happened organically. And on Friday after prayers, families would take their kids to the street, take photos of themselves in front of the murals. Um, I saw parents lay out wreaths, framed photographs of their sons next to their son's mural. And one father would come every day to sweep the pavement right next to his son's mural. So it gave this community a space and a chance to mourn at a time when it was easy to get lost in the death toll and not put faces to the numbers. It enabled these people to come together and gave them something that they had lost. And that for me was an extremely important emotional service to the community. So those two examples are proof, in my opinion, of how powerful the street art movement was at the time and how important it was to preserve it for future generations. It was a truly unique time in our history, visually, and in other parts of it. And not to run over on time, but there are governments around the world that choose to work with graffiti communities by offering them public spaces, which then they transform into collaborative efforts. And there, have, there has been proof or evidence or papers written on the fact that when you do this, it actually helps the local community. It can be an economic driver, it can increase value to property, and it gives civilians a civic purpose or a, a sense of belonging, a further belonging to their community. So thank you very much for your time, and that's it for me. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Khalid Al Bey. I'm a Sudanese political cartoonist uh, and artist. Um, I'm just gonna go quickly and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, no? There we go. All right, so I'm from Sudan. Um, we're all familiar with Sudan, but sadly not a lot of people know a lot of things about Sudanese people, including Sudanese people, um, which is we're trying to change right now. Uh, so Sudan used to be the biggest country in Africa, used to be the, the biggest country in the Arab world, it's part of, as I said, you know, part of the Arab world as well. 
There are studies that say that Sudan has the most ethnic groups in Africa, so everybody here can be Sudanese, anyone here. We have all looks, shapes. And uh, one of the things also that not a lot of people know is that we have the most pyramids in the world as well. But ours are skinnier and taller, like us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things happening now in Sudan as well with the, with the revolution and, um, and a lot of what you've been talking about as well. I mean, again, you know, one of the first things that you could see gradually, literally exploding was the art and now led to a whole area just introducing street art before nobody even can put a line in a wall without the police being on top of you. But now it's just everywhere. And it's exactly what's happening before. I was born in Romania. Uh, I'm a black Romanian, not a lot of us out there. Um, my father was a diplomat, that's, uh, that's why I was there. Uh, I come, as a lot of Sudanese people, I come from, and a lot of people in the region, I come from a very political family as well. Um, this is one of my uncles, his name is Babi Karanur, and he was the head of the uh, Communist Party. And he staged the coup against uh, Nimeri, our dictator in the 70s. And uh, the coup worked, and he was on his way back from London when Gaddafi downed his plane. And this is a photo from uh, a video for his like five minute trial, basically. Uh, which is available on YouTube, unfortunately. Um, this is also a um, grandfather uh, of mine. He just passed away. Um, I, I think anybody who's familiar with uh, Middle Eastern politics would uh, recognize him. His name is Abdurrahman Surat Dahab. Dahab. Uh, he was the interim president of Sudan from 1985 to 1986. And he's considered a legend until today just because he did his job. He gave power back to the people, which never happens. In, uh, in the region, of course. And he was an Islamist. So you can, you know, you can see I, I grew up around that conversation just happening around in, um, in, in the house. Uh, in 1989, because uh, of uh, al-Bashir coming to power, uh, there was a huge brain drain in Sudan. So because they, they basically uh, substituted everyone in the country for people from their own party. So uh, there, there are a lot of people left, um, engineers, artists, actors, uh, writers, intellectuals, artists, everyone left. And we ended up here in Qatar. And for me, being in Qatar, I think, was a huge, um, was a huge step for me. Because being in Sudan, of course, you're in class with everyone, but everybody's Sudanese. Most people are Sudanese. Different shades, different religions, but everybody's Sudanese. When coming to Qatar here and in, in class with me, there was around I don't know, 15 nationalities. So you know everyone, you know every language, you know how to say hi in every language, and it's, it was just, it was incredible. And the one thing that really, um, really attracted me was satire. Just figuring out that the jokes that we say about our president are the same jokes that the Egyptians say about their president, it's just different names. And then it's the same jokes that, so it's everyone is saying the same thing, everybody's saying the same thing, everybody's going through the same thing. And um, everybody ended up here. So for me, that was a, a, a just a, a you know a nice insight into into the world around me that we're not unique. Everybody's going through the same thing. Uh, this is just a picture of me and my father. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grew up liking uh, comics. I read a lot of comics. Uh, of course, it was translated DC and Marvel comics, uh, Superman and Batman. Of course, you know Clark Kent, Superman was his name was Nabil Fozzi, <laughs> and uh, you know the the comics had a lot stories, but nothing that related to us or our culture. Mm. So we were reading a lot about things that will never happen here. And this is, this is Iraqi uh, Superman. Actually, this is very rare. This is Iraqi Superman uh, magazine. You can see Superman has a mustache. Yeah. And Wonder Woman is a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they switched it up a little bit. Um, so in 1996, I started noticing my father buying these... Uh, this political cartoon-based Egyptian magazines. One is called Sabah al-Khair, which means good morning. The other one is called Rosal Yusuf, which is uh, the name of the founder. And it's kind of like the New Yorker, basically, in, 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 in Arabic. And, and, and for me, that just, you know, it was, it was just a light bulb went up, you know? And it was uh, basically what I was reading my whole life with this thing that I was interested in my whole life as well, which is politics and comics, both in one thing. And for me, politics was always interesting because it was the reason why I wasn't home. So just 
noticing how political cartoonists worked around censorship. And even in Egypt at Mubarak time, even if they were praising Egypt, but at this, and, and Mubarak and Sadat before him and all of that, but at the same time, you could, you could tell they're sarcastic. They're, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're beating around the bush. And that, for me, that was, that was incredible to see that you know, people actually risk their life to do these kind of things. And I just, you know, I just started copying and trying to, to, to uh, this, the style. And, you know, so I went from drawing Superman to trying to draw like people in class and, and, and my teachers they didn't like that at all. <laughs> and um, that also introduced me to, to, to one, of my, uh, one of my heroes and one of the heroes of, of I think, cartoonists in the world. Uh, his name is Najid Ali. He's a Palestinian cartoonist that was uh, assassinated in England in the, ninth, in the 80s, in the early 80s. And, and until today, nobody knows who assassinated him. Some people say it's the Palestinians, and some people say it's the, it was actually the Israelis. And what, I've, what I learned from Naji was, first of all, his style, and, and the character that you see in the corner there, his name is Hamdala, which uh, in, in English means uh, sour, I guess. And he's, he's a 10-year-old kid that's looking at the situation. And um, Najil Ali was 10 years old when he, when, when he, uh, was, when he, went, when he left Palestine. And, uh, sorry, when he left the refugee camp. And I was 10 years old when I left home. So for me, I always, I always uh, found that connection. And both of us had nothing but to look at the situation. You can't do really anything about it. And the other thing that I've learned from him as well is that it's, cartooning is not only about telling a joke. It's not about, uh, it's not, it's not about being ha-ha funny. It's about saying something, and it's a form of art. So I just started copying, like just copy, copy, copy. That's all I did. And I think if you see my work until today, it actually looks like this. Um, so I just started doing cartoons uh, I, after I graduated from university. I went to university. I had to study engineering, of course, because I'm Arab, and <laughs> you know you can't get married if you don't, you don't if you're not a doctor or an engineer. So um, I, I, I finished university, and then I started working here. I worked here for the museums, but at the same time, I was trying to really publish my work. So I went around to newspapers. I went here in Egypt. Even in Bahrain, I was just trying to go around and publish my work. But it, it didn't really work because, again, of censorship and, you know, you, you have a different style and, and, and your work is not funny. I was like, yeah, you know, my work is not funny because the situation is not funny. I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was an interesting time. And then after, after a while, I was like, you know what, I was actually get, got kicked out of an editor's office once. And it really bothered me because it wasn't even a good newspaper. I was like, you know what, nobody reads your newspaper anyway, man. <laughs> So I just went online, and, and, and uh, before Facebook, there was something called High Five. I don't know if anyone remembers it. Remember but <laughs> <laughs> so I just started putting my stuff. You know, I had a blog, and then I went on to uh, High Five. And then when Facebook came, I just started putting my work on Facebook. And it was just a few people just sharing my work and my friends. And you know, everybody's like, yeah, this is good. You know, you, should, you could go on. And um, I just started doing work, and I, started, and I saw that it just started circulating around. Uh, so this is a map of, of Sudan and it's being uh, hugged by this figure, and it's, it's, it's called Sudan Needs a Hug. And it just went everywhere. Every, a lot of people were sharing it and using it. And as you can see, I didn't, I didn't put my name because I didn't use to sign because at the same time, um, I didn't know how that worked because I, I, I have a job and then I have, you know, I'm, I'm drawing these political cartoons. I was like, eh. So um, I used my, the name that... Uh, the name of my family. So I, Khalid al-Bay is not really my official name. So I started using Khalid al-Bay and I was trying to have a pseudonym kind of. Um, so as you can see here, this is one of the women's group actually in Sudan using, using my work. And this is my father. He's like, he, sent me a, he sent me a photo of the, of the newspaper. It's like, isn't that your work? And I was very proud of it. I was like, oh, yes, exactly. And this is what I'm trying to, and everybody was telling me, oh, you should make money off of it. But it's, for me, it's not really about, about making money. It's about just trying to um, say exactly what we're saying here, you know, that this is a situation that's about the region and arts is part of that and it's all, it's all about making things, you know, asking questions, really. Um, so, yeah, it started circulating. This is, this is uh, when the Arab Spring started. Um, I remember I was in my office in, in, the, in, in the museum and everybody just stuck to TV watching uh, the, 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 the protesters in Egypt and thinking, uh, in Tunisia, and thinking that this is, this is going to go on. So the first day I did, a, I did a cartoon that I didn't know if I should show here. <laughs> um, and it was basically of my finger and uh, with, the, with the Tunisian flag on it and then with the Sudanese flag, Libyan flag, and Egyptian flag. And of course, 
protest happens in all these in all these countries. And the same day I did that cartoon, actually it went out. It was on Wikipedia, it was on Wikimedia, and everybody was using it and so on. And that's it. From that day on, I think for like eight years or something, I was doing a cartoon every day and I was writing every day. And I was just, you know, I was living on the internet just like everybody else, you know. And I remember this 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 cartoon I did, and it says it says Masr. Uh, and this is the face of Mubarak, but when you read it with the Tashkir, it actually says Musr, which means insisting, so insisting to stay. And this is was one of the Fridays that he was supposed to leave, but he didn't. Yeah. And um, so at the same day, I think a friend of mine, I don't know if you know Rana, Rana Jarbur? Yeah. So she, she stenciled that in Beirut. Yeah. And the same day as well, it was the, the, the Friday, people started sending me pictures of it in Egypt, and people were just using it and printing it and, and so on. And uh, I just felt, you know, imagine like being here in your, your small studio and people are using your work all over. So it was, it was I, I felt like this is personal to me. And it was personal because, as I said, you know, you know, politics for me was always the reason why I'm not home. So I really wanted to engage in that and, and, do, and, do, and do more work. Uh, again, you know, this is some stuff as well from Yemen and people started just using my work and, 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 and remixing it and so on. And all my work is free online. It's under Creative Commons license. You can use it and share it and so on. Um, so one day I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in the museum and uh, a, a, a journalist from the New York Times shows up. He's like, listen, we know it's you and we want to do this, this, this you know, interview with you. I was like, yeah, okay, great. I mean, I, this was the first time actually my face was, was on there. And of course, uh, it turned out, you know, like, oh, the artist of the revolution, pen of the revolution. And, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was very humbled by that. And um, I use it. I use it. It's on my CV, definitely. <laughs> but, you know, it's not, it's not true, of course, because, you know, this is how the media works things. I mean, you know, the media is very, it kind of makes, you know, this region is, is, is nothing is working. So there's one guy that's doing everything or there's one hero that there's this hope. So... Um, but I always say, you know, I'm, you know I, I used to draw, I draw cartoons, you know, people died in the street. So after that, I just, as I said, you know, I would just keep doing, doing cartoons and, and I lived in this culture, like this viral culture. So I just live online, basically. And this was a cartoon I've done after Charlie Hebdo. And uh, as you can see, it's just, it's the world pointing at this guy saying, you're with the terrorists. And then uh, the terrorists saying that, oh, you know, you're with the infidels, and the, the man in the middle is just saying, I'm just a Muslim. And that was 99.9% .9 of the world and how they feel. So, because n normally after, after a crisis, uh, cartoons get really boring, so, it's, you know, if, 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 because people don't know how to say things in a way that it's, you know, it's not, it's too quick. So, they don't want to really talk about the situation, they just want to show how sad it is and so on. So um, I decided to do something different and, and kind of talk about that. So the cartoon actually went viral as well, and it was used by a lot of media. And, and now I became the Muslim cartoonist. Like, there's no other Muslim cartoonist. <laughs> so the media, of course, you know, the Muslim cartoonist and his cartoon and da-da-da, you know. Um, I also did this cartoon, um, and it was about choices for Syrian children. And the first image you see there is for Alan Kurdi, who was the Syrian child who was found on the shores in, in Turkey. And it says, if you leave, and then next to it is a picture from a video of Amran Dingish, who is a, a Syrian child, from the viral video of, of him uh, in, in, in an ambulance, dazed and bloodied, and he doesn't know what's happening. And these pictures happened exactly a year apart. And what I wanted to show with this is that, you know, living on the internet, you, f you think that what the internet shows you, what, what the internet makes important, is the only thing that's important. So a year ago, this was, this was, was, was important. It's Alan Kurdi, and he's on the beach, and you know, there's a million things happening, and all of that. And, and then a year after this happened, and it's like it's the only thing that happened in the world at that time. So what I wanted to say is that these things happen every day, and these things are happening probably exactly when, you know, now, when we're talking. So I wanted to show that it's not only about the internet, and it's not only about these, these uh, these things, oh wow, <laughs> after 30 seconds. So again, these, these things started happening. These are another uh, viral cartoons. This is another cartoon I've done uh, when I was doing a documentary, a short documentary for The Guardian in the States. And it's about Colin Kaepernick uh, and his uh, uh, appeal against uh, the, 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 the police brutality in America. And again, this went viral and people started using it and so on. And now it became like the Black Fist cartoonist. <laughs> 
Um, I do other projects as well whenever I have the time, whenever I have the space. I'm doing this project here. It's called Doha Fashion Fridays, and it's about, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a fashion blog mixed with a, a, um, like a Humans of New York kind of thing. And it's about the workers here and their day off uh, Friday in Doha. Uh, this is also another work that I've done. Uh, I do installation works uh, and if, if I have space. So cartooning for me is something that I do fast when I, because this is what I do. It's online and, and everything is fast. But whenever I get a space, I, do, I try to do as much as I can bigger and, and uh, so on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Atiyaf, I'd like to start with you. Some, some literary figures, uh, such as Taha Hussein or Algerian novelist uh, Amin Zawi, critique the production of literature while revolutionary events are ongoing. Uh, they see such writings of the moment as weak, far from contemplative, and mixed with emotions, resulting in literature that is geared towards media consumption. Um, as somebody who is writing a novel set in Yemen where a war continues to rage, what, are, what is your reaction to those critiques? I think that's a very good question and, and very valid arguments. Um, for me, for example, my novel uh, addresses a lot, mostly addresses the revolution, which for now it's been many years later. Um, uh, and, and the violence that, for example, that many of us witnessed, whether it's, it's you know, on, in Change Square, or whether it's through the testimonies, for example, that I had collected from victims of drone strikes, victims of the war on terror, uh, um, survivors in, in jails, and all of these very, very difficult questions that at that time I couldn't process. But now, many years later, I'm able to revisit somewhat uh, with a distance. And so, for me, I guess my writing isn't necessarily writing in the moment because I'm not writing it in 2011. And so I could, un I could understand that writing it, for example, writing about the ongoing war is very extremely difficult, it's very emotional, um, but I don't see emotional as something negative as well. I think uh, a lot of times, I mean, cognitive science tells us that people respond uh, to what we see in the world, right? Uh, based on, um, we go towards these narratives that we've, con subconscious narratives uh, that we've constructed, um, and, and people respond better actually to emotions rather than to facts. And therefore, if you engage with people on an emotional level, you actually are more able to change narratives than you are maybe through, um, fa through workshops. Sorry, policy world. <laughs> but uh, I, I do believe that that's, uh, that's n being emotional is not necessarily an, a, a, negative, a negative thing, but I do understand why it might, it might be geared towards, um, if it's too sensationalist, it will be geared towards, um, towards the media. But again, it all have, depends on how you write things. If you provide space for complexities, if you provide space for many different stories, then it's not just this one story narrative, and it's less sensationalist, and therefore, mm -hmm. I, I, don't think, I don't see that as negative. Okay, thank you. Suraya, let's, let's talk about art and collective amnesia. Does art always play a positive role in that regard, or does it not sometimes reinforce collective amnesia about the past? For example, a statue or a memorial that tells only a part of the story, and all the other parts of the story are left out. Or um, a song, um, thinking Tislam al Ayadi, for example, <laughs> in 2013, an Egyptian pop song that praised, uh, praises the Egyptian military uh, at a very interesting sort of time. Uh, in Egypt's history. So what, what are your thoughts on the role of art and this societal amnesia? I mean, uh, the street art that I followed, it was clearly the viewpoint of some groups, not necessarily everyone. And there were, you know, cases where it was appropriated by very different, very polar opposite political groups, some that actually from, an, from a, a principal perspective, you know, are quite opposed to art, to creative expression, to, to freedom of speech, but actually they appropriated it for communicating their message. So 
what part does it play in collective amnesia? It does play a part, but again, like I said, I'm very biased. So <laughs> I just see the positive in it because I focused on one group. I did not focus on the other. So I did not document, let's say, graffiti that was in favor of the status quo. And there was. And there was graffiti that was in favor of the ruling political party of the time. And that kept changing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't interested in that um, because mostly it was ugly. And um, they didn't know how to do it right. And in that sense, if someone was out there who could have documented everything, which would have required superhuman powers and to be at different places at different times, at the same time, then yeah, we could have a full, a full perspective on the subject. Mm -hmm. So art will never be the complete truth. It is biased because it's made from emotion, it's made from a perspective. And uh, I, it shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Khaled, as an artist currently working at an international sort of institution um, in Copenhagen, what is your assessment of the role of such international institutions in supporting the work of revolutionary artists in the Arab world? Um, does, does your art get lost in translation in your interactions with international institutions? Um, my work normally, uh, I, try, I try as much as I can not to use language. And because I, I think that was one of the barriers that you know, we, we couldn't get our news through from like our, our news from our side, you know. So for me, because being, in, being, being in the intersection between art and journalism, really. So, so for me, partly it's, in from, you know, so it's giving out information as well. So I try as much as I can. If, like, if, if it gets lost in translation, that means it's my, it's my fault. So, um, but like the, the role of international um, institutions, I think it's, um, It was, it really, I mean, it really helped a lot of artists, um, activists that were in, in the region during the, you know, during the Arab Spring, that after the counter-revolutions happened and after everything went kind of settled down, most of my friends had to leave because you, you, you can't practice your work and it's this, this explosion of freedom that happened during the, the protests and during you know, the height of the revolution is, is, is now looked at as a crime. So they, they had to leave, a lot of people had to leave. Um, but at the same time, you know, these, these, these organizations, um, they, do, you know, they, 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 they do help, but at the same time, they're, you know, they're, their governments are part of the problem as well. So you, you, it's, you really find yourself in a, in a weird, Situation, you know, because they're tapping themselves on the back, and you're in, you're in the, you're in the middle, you know, you, you're, you can't go back, but you really can't, you stay here. You're like, no, you're actually not that good, you know. So, you're, you're trying to explain things to both, both sides. Thank you. All right, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I'll probably take a couple of questions at a time. Please uh, wait for the microphone to come to you, and uh, it would be great if you could very briefly introduce yourself and keep your questions and comments concise, please. So, do we have any questions? Okay, I'll, we'll go here and then over here. So here first, please, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm the ambassador. Yes. Hello? Yes. I'm the ambassador of Ecuador, but I'm originally artist. So you took me back 40 years ago, oh, wow. if not more. And I wanted to ask, uh, do you think that the best art, I mean, in all, all fields, not only, the, I'm an artist in painting, I'm, but in writing, in graffitis, in whatever, photography, or cartoon, or art comes only when you, have, you are suffering, when it's uh, wars, when there are problems, when there are revolutions, when there's something going on. So that's the best art. Uh, with me, it happened also. I lived the war in Lebanon. My children were born under the bombs, and only I saw bombs. So I couldn't say it in words, so I went into arts. So it means that we have to suffer and put emotions and put ourselves out is that the way only artists, the best artists, if you take Pablo Picasso, Guernica was the first, the best, so the war. 
So everything has to be about wars in order to put out the best of an artist. It means it's about our inner, to with less suffering, we do something that is beautiful. Is it that true? Thank you. Let's take one more question, please, over here. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Mohamed Al-Jabri. I'm a recent Georgetown University graduate. Um, my wife and I both uh, make films from Yemen. We're from Yemen. Um, and uh, we make documentaries. Um, I, I don't f see myself now making um, fiction films because there is this urgent sense of, of documenting what's going on. Um, when it comes to art, especially that of fiction, um, do you think that it has a role in documenting ju even just the, the sentiments, the, what's going on, uh, not facts, if, if one might argue, uh, or should fiction should be exempt from that and, and viewed as, well, it's, it's art that gives people a space to heal um, and um, f for them to appreciate uh, culture. Thank you. Thank you. Atef, would you like to take that question up? Sure. And then we'll go to the we'll other panelists. And then, yes. Um, okay, I'll start with the last question. No, I definitely think that art has a role to play in documenting. I mean, it, it depends on what type of artist you know you want, you are, and what you want, what, where you find yourself leaning towards. And I think we see that in Yemen. You know, we see that with your great work. The, the, it's a great film, by the way. You all should watch it. Uh, we see that uh, this table's a bunch of creatives I'm, uh, from Yemen, by the way, <laughs> just to let you know. But we see that uh, also from Bushra al Maqtari's uh, la last book, where she documented uh, at, at least 40 stories from the war in her, in her um, short stories that half fiction, half truth. Um, um, and, and it's very important. We see that with the street art also. Uh, for example, there was a campaign uh, for the disappeared. And, and everybody had forgotten about who they were, and then their, their faces were, you know, throughout all of, you know, the country. That's, that's important work, and I'm not trying to belittle that in any way. Uh, uh, I just think, for me, that wasn't the road I was able to do, was able to take anymore. Simply, I think, because of where I was in my mental state, I could no longer uh, continue to do that at that time. And, and, and I think those who could, you know, why not? Um, uh, to answer your question, is art only about, from, comes from suffering? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I do think maybe great art sometimes comes from suffering, mainly because we're able to tap into the deepest of our, you know, as you know, the deepest, uh, the very, very deep uh, places where we try not to go, where we try to avoid. Uh, and I think by doing that, you know, it's a process of inner healing and, and at the risk of sounding too hippie-ish, it's, I do believe this. I mean, I think inner peace uh, is the start of peace in a society, of inner peace, family peace, community peace, and then a nation that heals. And broken people can't bring, you know, can't heal a nation. You need to self-reflect. You need to work on yourself. And I do think if more activists um, focus less on our, or their, I don't know yet what am I anymore, grander and focused more on self-reflection and healing, maybe we could sustain the movements longer. I'll stop here. Thank you. Soraya? Uh, to answer your question, I, I do believe that art comes from suffering, but I also think it comes from having a space. Mm -hmm. And in the case of street art, something broke and it gave birth to this sudden courage where people automatically took to the wall and many of them had never picked up a spray can or a paintbrush before but there was somehow this organic human instinct of I need to write this, I need to make this and if there hadn't been that breaking into the space it wouldn't have happened and the last time I wrote on my blog was the time when I felt that that space had been removed and disappeared and so I stopped documenting graffiti because there was none. And what, contain, what, what existed was very little and very abstract from the reality. I mean, for me, it was um, you know, going, going to Copenhagen now. I mean, as I said, I've been working for, since 2008, I've been, or nine, I've been doing cartoon every day or writing every day or doing something. 
But now, uh, even including my time in the, in the States, but when, when I went to Copenhagen, I took a step back because I was doing exactly that. I was trying to look into, is this all I'm going to do? I'm just going to be online the whole time and just, that's, is that what I'm doing? Because, you know, cartooning is a negative art to begin with. But when, when you work on the news, it's, it's, it's like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being part of the news cycle now. So am I doing good? Is that good or bad? And so I was just asking myself all of these questions because for me, I just found out that you know, news now became entertainment, right? So I could do a cartoon about Trump every day, but is that going to change anything? Is that going to, but it's not, it's not. But at the same time, you feel guilty. For me, I felt really guilty because you know, I'm in Copenhagen, everybody's in bikes and it's nice and you know, but is that why, am I not suffering anymore? Am I being selfish? Because you know, my, I just left my friends who really can't do anything. Uh, you know, they don't have the freedom that I do. Am I not doing them right? So it's, 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 really, it's, a, it's really a syndrome, I guess, for everybody that leaves. Uh, if you're really involved and you, and, and you try to take a step back, it's, it's extremely hard. And that's why now, exactly like Atiaf, I'm trying to like stay, get out of the internet and do, do things uh, in, in, in reality uh, and, and, and do bigger things, I guess. But again, the internet is that only connection. And the internet is just f filled with bad news because bad news sells, right? Exactly. But um, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's very, it's very hard to, uh, to, n not, to do it out of not suffering, you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Last round? One here? Over here. And two. Okay. These will have to be the last two questions, unfortunately. Um, hello, um, my name is Amar Kamash. I am an artist and the founder of uh, Fun Art Qatar. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for the amazing talk and discussion. Uh, my question is, um, I felt this region, I consider myself young. I mean, I just turned 30, but I'm young, I know. <laughs> and I haven't seen that, uh, ha th that kind of revolution in art uh, since, you know, for so many years. And when the Arab Spring happened, it was a way for so many artists to express and talk. And finally, maybe we had an issue and we had a platform to speak about so many issues. Now, my, my question is, um, I think now the Arab Spring is fading out. Some of the countries, you know, are in peace with themselves and some countries are, you know, they're still in the war. But um, when are we gonna go to the next level, which is like, you know, addressing serious social issues instead of just politics. Uh, we've been talking about politics in, uh, as um, an art for so long that we forgot to talk about, you know, ourselves and the social issues and social norms and social problems we have in our societies. Do you think that, is it too, um, too late to talk about this? Or one day will come when we have no other topics to talk about them? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, over here, please. Hi. Um, I have a, a quick comment and a, and a quick question. Um, I, I feel like uh, the, um, the framing uh, that, um, in a sense, of art, is, is art useful, is art uh, political, or what's its purpose in revolution and so on, um, comes from a position of weakness, right? That we are always having to defend art in these spaces. Um, and I feel like uh, we're, you know, in a, in a sense, our, our political leaders need to defend themselves about their sort of validity rather than uh, art having to prevent itself, uh, you know, sort of defend itself in the sense that we're always, um, you know, um, art is one part of the puzzle, right? And your art is one part of the puzzle. Um, so I just I feel like, you know, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be defensive um, about, about art. Um, I just have a, a question for uh, Suraya. You were saying that um, graffiti, in, in some cases, uh, some governments have taken up uh, graffiti. Um, and I was wondering if something is lost when governments take up uh, this kind of street art, that part of the power of it is that it's illegality. Um, and so I just want, well, was hoping you could comment on, on that when governments take up something that was essentially supposed to be uh, illegal. Thank you. We're, we're standing between them and food, so <laughs> uh, please make your responses short. 
Okay, um, to answer your question about uh, social issues, um, in the case of, of Egypt, a lot of social issues were brought up through street art and graffiti. Uh, there was a, a lot of campaigning for equal rights, women's rights, um, um, against certain uh, practices of torture, unfair imprisonment. Um, there were uh, awareness campaigns that were to do with social causes that at the time became relevant because suddenly there was a lot of attention and focus on the street. So it wasn't that they were less relevant or not talked about, but suddenly the space was given for people to actually talk about it, make art about it. And it was, it was seen, it was recorded by the media, by international media, so it was given a lot of space and a lot of attention where without the political events, I don't think it would have had the opportunity. So in the case of Egypt, I think, we can talk about this later in detail, but my answer is shortly yes. Okay. okay. Now, in answer to your question, uh, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, when, when a government uh, would work with graffiti artists by you know, offering them a space or let's do this together, you definitely take away some of the legitimacy. I mean, you give legitimacy, but you take away some of the power um, of these graffiti artists. And I think there are still those who would say, well, I'm not going to work with the government because my entire cause, my existence is to work against them. And so by working with them, I'd be selling out. And there are others that think, no, there's a positive side to this, you know. And uh, the case, I mean, one of the cases is Bogota, uh, Bogota, Colombia, where they actually, the government gave this space to these artists. And it was successful in, fa in that they noted the consequences were quite positive for the community as well as for the artists. Because it gave them a sense of power. And it gave them a sense that they were participating in making something for their country instead of being felt that they were ostracized from the, the discourse itself. Thank you. Um, just for, for Ammar, I think, yes. I think you can't put borders, for me. I don't think it's like this is political and this is social. I think it's all, it all depends on freedom, really. Like if, it's, if there's freedom to talk about issues, this, you can talk about political, you can, so, you, can, you can really talk about all, there's an open floor to talk about all things. But I, I think it's, you know, everything is political at the end of the day, you know. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's the main idea is to have an overall freedom of thought and freedom of speech to, 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 to do that. Can I just add one quick last thing? I, I, I do think it's important to define also, to, to not limit art to just uh, useful art. Maybe we are thinking that we're doing useful art. But art can exist just to exist, and that there is this type of art, and we need to appreciate, I would say, all types of art. But we are talking about socially and politically engaged art, and I do think, I'd love to discuss with you later, that it does exist in Yemen, and it's actually increasing and in the region uh, more and more. And I'll end with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to our panelists who flew from faraway places to uh, share some fascinating and ultimately very personal stories um, about the role of art in, uh, in life, really, not just politics. Um, so please join me in thanking them and continue the conversation. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.